Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they got it absolutely correct in a predictive manner. And uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation here in a couple of weeks with the guests that I'm going to have on. This is Tom Novolis, your host, and I am extremely delighted and pleased that you are here with me this week. Uh, it's been an exciting week with all the various weather, the fires that are going on, all of the other natural effects. But remember, one thing for sure is that uh, the winds are held in God's storehouse, and uh, he takes and will activate all of that which he holds in his hands, in his storehouse, according to his purposes. So, yeah, take a deep breath. Know that ultimately, in the midst of all of our challenges, that uh, God is in charge. And that's something that I want to talk to you about a little bit today, is when it comes to science. Is science or is it not science? Uh, is science even believable anymore from the whole perspective of what we're seeing with this COVID insanity and the way that it's being manipulated and utilized. I kept thinking about it for quite a while and going, you know, what is going on here? Why do we have so many people that don't want to research for themselves, look at real science, look at that which you can find answers in relationship to the fact that masks don't work, in relationship to all of the testing with COVID had many, many different problems. Uh, you can find many, many resources to determine that the Delta variant, you can't even test for it. There's no mechanism for testing for it. So how do they even know that it exists? So on and on and on and on. And you may ask the question, well, Tom, what gives you even the slightest capacity to ask any questions about science? Well, let me remind you, those that know me, and many of you do, many of you do not, and especially those out there in the blog sphere, in the podcast sphere, and on uh, the various video channels that uh, I post at, I have a background in physics, I have a background in radiological chemistry, I have a background in cryogenics. I think those are hard sciences the last time that I looked. And when I look at those, I go, hmm, yeah, there is methods for understanding empirical data. Then I start to think a little bit more and go, oh, yeah, I do have a background in uh, optical physics. I have a background in what it means to do electronic optical engineering. Um, I have a background in data science and the hard, not just the software side of it, but also in hardware development and where I sat on development boards and gave the ideas to develop some of the uh, technology that was used and, and first brought the 10 gigabit type of networks uh, into existence. Hmm. Yeah, I think I know a little bit about science. And, and then where it really gets me is that I did have opportunities to participate in DARPA projects and go to meetings with DARPA where I did question. Oh, that's right. Tom, forget. You forget what DARPA is the, advent, the defense advanced research what? Programs agency. So it's a part of the government that does skunk works, does uh, different type of technology efforts. Any, you name it, they do it. They help fund it. Um, so it becomes an interesting world to be able to have uh, a view into to understand that there is good projects and then there is a lot of wasted money. And we're going to talk about some of that as we run through the course of the program today. But where I wanted to open up 
in the program and kind of focus some thoughts is how is science not science anymore? How is science just this political, almost theology, all and unto itself? How is science turned into the bastardization of truth? How is science turned into the questioning of a thesis becomes a battleground upon which those that hold positions opposite to what is being promoted turn into what? Are, are attacked, are said they are not of science. Well, I, I was scratching my head about a lot of that. Scratching my head about all these arguments back and forth about the COVID in particular, um, the masking, non masking, the jab, the, you know, the validity of uh, the mRNA, the, the push on, you know, pseudoscience. Oh, here's another one for you is that when it comes to the whole thing on the um, DNA, I know the guys that did the human, what, genome project. Yeah, they were computer scientists that I had the privilege of interacting with. And in fact, in one of the companies that I was part of as a senior manager in the startup of a particular company, yeah, we worked with those guys. We interacted with them. And uh, it was very, very interesting when we asked about the different concepts of morality and the perversion of morality, one of the persons looked at me and said, what morality? Shock. What morality? That caused great pause. And then again, as I have been trying to think through all of this science isn't science, I then heard something by R.C. Sproul that I, I love going back and listening to R.C. Sproul on stuff. The guy was just, you know, God blessed him as a genius, just a flat out genius. And one of the things that Sproul happened to be talking about at the time was on positivism. Positivism. Now, positivism is a philosophy that came about by, as Sproul introduced it, and I forgot, by Augustus Comte. And he lived in that period between 1798 and 1857. And he was a, oh, a philosopher, a sociologist, a, you know, dabbler in, in the arts is the way I always call it. Philosophy has been around for a long time. But sociology, in, in my opinion, is something which it's not just my opinion, it's that of others, came about because psychology and philosophy was getting full and they needed to figure out something else to do with these pilot high and deeps, especially back in that time. But here's what happened. And, and this is something that we have to take into account as we begin to go into why science is not science when it comes specifically to COVID. Now, there's a lot of references that I have, and you're going to have to go to uh, Samuel Adams Returns over my shoulder, samueladamsreturns.net, to go look at the references, because I'm not going to just spew them out uh, during our conversation today. But Comp's work, what he was trying to say is that um, if you can't see it, if you can't empirically put your hands on it and prove it, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't exist and it's mean, not just that it doesn't matter, it's meaningless. It has no conceptualization. You're wasting your brain power 
to even think about it. So what I do want you to go to is for sure the RC Sproul link that I have for you because Sproul takes you through this really great explanation of what happened, not just from the whole idea of the uh, biblical perspective of God, but then the humanist side of what it means for uh, transcendent type of activities and, and what does that look like and the whole fact that Comp in his writings, he just blows it all the way. He just takes it and says, you know, forget it. You don't, you don't even need it. So when we take a look and we define this whole idea of positivism, it becomes a problem even within Christianity. I will talk about a little bit about that in the next segment, but as we're winding down in these last three and a half minutes or so of this particular segment, I want to give you a couple highlights. And what has happened is that the whole idea of uh, logical positivism, uh, as, as it has been called, or positivism, or the idea of uh, the logical empiricism, these uh, doctrines, these ideas, this whole uh, concept in, turned into science, not, not just into philosophy, but it was pushed all the way down into science. And that if you could not empirically prove it, if you could not define it in such a manner that you can see it, smell it, taste it, put the senses on it, it was meaningless. So I guess when we look at COVID and that a lot of the testing on COVID, and especially on these new strains, you can't see it, you can't put your fingers on it. Oh, using their logic, this is the logic of the what? The empiricist, this is the logic of positivism, is that it's meaningless. But, but, what has happened is that the politicalization, making it political to move an agenda forward, becomes now what science is all about. It's no longer even in this whole idea of positivism. Now, positivism, it kind of hit the toilet and was flushed for a good number of years. But as you'll see in some of the references, the articles and the writings were from 2019. And the resurgence of positivism, the resurgence of using quasi-fake empirical information the data that comes out of the CDC and NIH, which we're going to talk about NIH in a second, the perversion of Fauci and the NIH, um, we'll, we'll talk about that here in the second segment. But the facts are that, you know what? Scientists are no longer even looking for real data unless it fits their what? The message, unless it fits what they want to push. No different than climate change, no different than uh, all of the leftist, socialist, and communist views of things that are destructive of what is our foundational view of rights and that which we are as humans. Most important, as I leave you in this last 30 seg seconds, is that with positivism, logic, logical positivism, God is meaningless. Don't even think about a God, because it's not that there isn't a God, it's meaningless. Meaningless. And this is an impact, even within the churches, when we take some of the looks at the biblical view of things. So Sam Adams really understood foundational truth as well as a number of the anti-federalists. So come on back in the next segment as we dig deeper 
and to logical positivism, science isn't science. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second segment of Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they had a clear view of truth, and they were able to take and articulate truth because not only did they have the full advantage of Reformation truth, they studied history, and lastly, most importantly, they had faith. They had what they understood, especially from the New Testament and Jesus' own words, that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Now, <laughs> we've got lots of mountains to move, but you know what? As we were in the last segment, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I want to bring your attention to uh, something that I have there in the archives over my shoulder at samueladamsreturns.net. And this work is called Positivism and Christianity, a study of theism and verifiability by Kenneth Klein. And uh, this was uh, done at The Hague, published through The Hague in 1974. Now, the interesting aspect of it, and I'm not going to try and dig you through all of the details, but I want to set the stage. First off, you're looking at The Hague, which is the area there for international law. It is all part of the area there in the Netherlands that is established for what the NATO, and it has a lot of a global uh, reference point, almost you know, sig as as significant in its insanity as as the United Nations. The interesting piece of this, and I want to just take you through the table of contents, and when we're looking at especially legal positivism and how that affects into theology, and then what does that mean in relationship to? Uh, the last segment where we'll cover back into science. And in this segment, I'll try and cover some of it on constitutionalism as well because of the implications and the push that has happened in this whole movement and resurgence of positivism for the sole purposes of manipulating language. So when we look at all that is happening from the dialectic, how it is taking and looking at, oh, here's a thesis, no, here's an antithesis, we'll come to a compromise, boom. Well, that's why you had 19 Reputicans, I almost said Republicans, which, you know, okay, they are, Reputicans uh, taking and voting with the enemy, which that is what the Democrats clearly are in our modern society, is they are the enemy of our Declaration of Independence and our enemy of our Constitution. I say that clearly and definably and defensibly, I can defend it, is that what Madison, John Adams clearly said that this Constitution is only for a moral and religious slash virtuous people. But we don't have that. We definitely don't have moral leadership. Oh, wait a minute, Tom, there you go on that again. Wait a minute, let's go back now to this whole idea of, well, where do you get this idea of morality? Whose morality? Who's defining it? According to the, you know, these positivists, they, you know, overlook and they overview this from a perspective that the statement that God exists, as it is here in the contents, table of contents of this paper, is that the statement that God exists is at least putatively a statement of fact. Well, if it's a statement of fact, that means that the necessary condition of it is that a fact must be verifiable, empirically verifiable by putting your eyes, or in my case, I, on it. 
by taking and being able to touch it, to be able to taste it, to be able to run mathematical analysis against it, which it was very interesting. If you really go out there and start to do your homework, is that by virtue of looking at quantum mechanics, eternity can be proven by the concepts of the what? A shift in the what? realities, a shift in time, space, dimensional shifts can be proven in quantum mechanics. So to me, that is empirically able to be verifiable. I used to want to do the math, and I started doing all the math on that, but I'm going, why? You know what? Faith is easier. Believing that there is eternity, believing that God is eternal, believing the fundamentals of all of the solid Reformation classical writings and catechisms is much easier than taking and developing a big board that has all of the math on it within the concepts of quantum mechanics. So, back to the table of contents on this paper. And once again, let me slide up so you use positivism. Positivism, you know, could be a tongue twister. Try it a few times. Positivism and Christianity, a study of theism and verifiability. Interesting paper. Very, very interesting paper. So another idea, as we go back to this one in the first chapter, is the third point saying the statement that God exists is not verifiable in retrospect. And then it's unintelligible words and unintelligible sentences. That's the appendix there. Chapter two is theism without belief in God. So religious belief construed as a moral commitment. Well, there we go. Moral commitment. Religious belief construed as slanting. How do you define it? How do you slip it? How does it become uh, this whole idea of environmentalism? How does it become the idea that masks will save you? How does it become an idea that mRNA will save you? Is that really science? Where is the data? Why are we having these conflicting positions? And anybody that has a conflicting position, they're whacked out. They're out there and I'm pushing my left hand way off the screen. They're off the screen. They're off the charts. They don't matter because according to these scientists, haha, at NIH and all these other politicists, the others are meaningless and do not matter. Oh, religious belief construed as the contemplating of a symbol picture. Interesting. Now we're making these symbols and pictures, and it's all construed. There's no reality to it, is there? So the testability and factual significance. The search for a criterion of factual significance. Formulations and difficulties. The paradigm case, the criterion of verifiability. Well, how do you know? What? How do you define verifiability? So staying within the framework, if you will, of uh, verifiability, I will tell you that I have, and I mentioned it a few times, not a lot, in other programs, is that I have seen evil eye to eye. I have seen those types of things that are manifestations of evil. And I'm telling you, it is chilling to the bone unless you are there before Jesus Christ, who has overcome it all, who cast out the demons into the pigs 
and made them run into the water, who cast out demons, who healed lepers. The miraculous is the verifiable peace. Now, the idea that we don't see all of those miraculous in our culture doesn't mean that it's not happening in other cultures, in other places. And in retrospect, on the other hand, better is that in other cultures, like down in Haiti, in South America, in Central America, in Africa, in places in Asia, you can see the occult, you can see the demon worship and the demon activities take and just formulate and become that reality that is verifiable. So it's not an issue of what it is. It does become a question of finding what is the criteria of verifiability. And then in the criteria of verifiability, where is that in principle? And then how do you extend that criteria? How do you know the falsibility of it? Partial viability. I mean, these are, you know, these are like, come on. And then what is the statements about unobservable, the unobservableness in science? Well, how do you even find and define and quantify that science is true and verifiable when dissenting opinions within the context of science and those scientists that went to almost exactly the same schools and have, you know, pilot high and deeps from almost the same school or in some cases the same schools take opposing positions. But yet, as we see in this whole area of the COVID debacle, if it's not in the political positioning of those of the bureaucrats in power, then your view, your ability to verify, your ability to prove it empirically doesn't matter. And they are meaningless. And so are you. You see, that's what's happening. So when I started listening and paying attention and going back and having R.C. Sproul, you know, go and postulate, actually more than that, prove out what has happened and prove out that any time that you throw God out of the question and you have no faith in the actions, in the proofs of what the God of the universe is, then you're left to your own devices. I mean, uh, go back and study Romans, and it's extremely clear in there that God leaves humans to their own devices. And what I will say from a, oh yeah, I do have a degree in behavioral science, so you know that means I can clearly say you're left to your own insanities, which you are. If you can't take and understand the foundational biblical truths, you're left just making it up as you go. And as we talk about making it up as we go in the next segment, we're going to talk about the uh, science of COVID, what's happening with all of the uh, constitutional side of it, what are the potentials, how is it that we can have all of these illegal actions being accepted when our founders would have looked at it all and said, are you crazy? How is it that you will allow the tyranny of a bunch of bureaucrats to define your reality, especially bureaucrats that have no instance or love of God? What, what, what's the matter with you? Well, we could say they're Tories. You know, oh, wait a minute, Tories were Anglicans. Well, you know what, that's fine, but they had their theology all messed up when it came to accepting everything that government said, everything that the parliament said, everything that the king 
said. No, 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 that's not what the Reformation biblical truth is all about. So come on back in the next segment as we dive into that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this last segment of Samuel Adams Returns, those anti-federalists. Yes, they predictively analyzed what was happening, and they got it right for the most part. You know what? But when we do take a look at how the Constitution should be implemented, we absolutely, as Madison said, as well as Thomas Jefferson said, you need to go back to what? You need to go back to the ratifying conventions to get a clear picture of what was acceptable by the people for implementing the Constitution. And that meant the whole idea of federalism, which I'm not going to get into all of that. So we left off the last segment, and uh, you're going to have to go look at the resources there at samueladamsreturns.net for yourself and take a look at the uh, article there, the, the, what I put up on positivism and Christianity, a study of theism and verifiability. It's only 10 pages long. It's, it's not that long uh, for you to delve into. Now, uh, what I wanted to take and, and share was an article here uh, from uh, Paul Gould, and he talks about the return of the logical positivist. And that has come back, as I mentioned and inferred earlier, especially within the concept of the churches. And looking at the theological claims of uh, the believer don't even have the dignity of being dubbed false. They, you know, become the point of utter nonsense. And what we have then is a, a whole idea that uh, there, there shouldn't be a dispute. There should be no dispute between Christianity and science. The very good article. I highly recommend that you go to the archives and uh, take a look at that as well. Uh, it, it gets into some, you know, I just think some interesting concepts that uh, run those arguments. And again, go back to what I suggested to you from R.C. Sproul. That's right there, I think, at the top of the reference list. And uh, very interesting. Now, what we're also seeing is more so now in the 20th and 21st century is that legal positivism or this empiricism is taking in having an effect uh, within psychology and what it, where it's touching into that. So now it's not just touching on science, but in, I always called psychology a pseudoscience. And it, I just want to hit this real fast is that if you want to understand real psychology, really what it is, you need to go to the book of Psalms. Everything about humans and human emotion is in the Psalms. That's where God put it all. David was an emotional person, but he was one that understood that connection between the psyche, the physical component of who we were and are, and God's response and our human interaction within that reality. Not in the, oh, it doesn't matter because there is no God. Oh, wait a minute. God is meaningless because you can't prove God. So then Psalms and all of psychology and everything else would be meaningless, right? Because if you can't understand the human psyche based on the idea of creation, wait a minute, you're not created. Are you confused yet? Or do you have clarity that all of this other ideas of science, psychology, and other baloney does not have any meaning unless it is God-centered meaning, unless it's biblically, reformationally true? Anyway, we kind of jumped all the way through all of that, but um, here's a couple things that I wanted you to take a look at. Uh, the philosophy of COVID-19, is it even possible to do the right 
thing. So this is where, again, we're looking at it from that philosophical perspective. We're looking at it from this positivism perspective. We're looking at it from even the ethics of how you reach into it. But you're not looking at it constitutionally. You're not looking at it from the point of the Declaration of Independence on what is the real purpose of government, but to secure our God-given rights, nothing else. All right. So in starting off with that, there is another article you need to go look at. It's called Logical Positivism and the Scientific Method in Genetic Algorithmics. Yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I just it's, it's just amazing on how this is all linked back into science in such a way that, you know, it's all phony baloney. Because the simplest thing I always say is, you know what, faith in God. So with that, I wanted to take you through a couple areas here of interest. Uh, let me see if I can slide back over here. These were in the Federalist, a couple of things. And this gets into the real questions. We've got a couple in the hill. The resources are all there. Please go to samueladamsreturns.net if you're listening to the podcast or if you're taking and hearing it on the radio or if you're going to the website. Go to the resources. And just This isn't just talking out of my ears, and I'm not just a, a standard pundit. Um, but one that I want to take you through immediately as I flip to it here uh, on the when things are meaningless. So as I mentioned in the first segment, I had been to DARPA Tech. I've seen a lot of different things. I questioned things from a moral perspective, especially being as a Christian, what we were doing scientifically and what DARPA does and what the then different agencies do. And then what does the NIH do and all of that? Very interesting article that's here in um, The Federalist. It's an investigation that I mentioned a couple weeks ago. Federal grant sponsored possibly live baby harvesting at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, through FOIA requests, what it's very becoming clear. Let me say it's becoming clear. The, the evidence is there through FOIA requests that the uh, David Daladin Center for Medical Progress uh, released the details of a $3 million grant that they received from the National Institute of Health. That's Fauci's crowd. Okay, I want to make sure you understand Fauci's evil, and he just makes it up as he goes for all of his own, in my opinion, and I'll state it as that, personal gain or power grabs. But here it is. They gave to the University of Pittsburgh $3 million grant to create a fetal, quote, tissue hub, unquote, to dismember and distribute the organs of full-term aborted babies selected by race for inhumane experiments. And if that wasn't appalling enough, as it is in this article, new evidence points to the University of Pittsburgh harvesting organs from born-alive babies as a real possibility, meaning that babies would have died while researchers dissected their bodies for kidneys and other organs. This is all from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services really re recently handed over the documents thanks to lawsuits by Judicial Watch that formed under the Freedom of Information Act forcing this to come forward. And that this is from that University of Pittsburgh's work to graft the full thickness scalps of unborn babies into the backs of rodents in the study funded by Anthony Fauci's NIAID office. NIH and the university uh, 
uh, are just operationalized or grotesquely baby organ bank funded by federal taxpayer dollars. So when we look at this whole idea of logical positivism and that there is no God, then that also means that Fauci has no problem doing these, what, gain-of-function research. And he doesn't care if a pandemic comes in there. And if he's working with Bill Gates and several others, who Bill Gates absolutely believes in population control, that's empirical because he said it, and you can find it out there, so that's empirical, is that you're having your taxpayer dollars operating under positivism, logical positivism, because God is meaningless. Everything else is meaningless. It's only what can be proven in the research. And who cares if people die? Who cares? It's all in the matter of science. Science. When science is not science. Experimentation is a matter of what? Anyway, let's jump back to another one. And here's where it gets into a number of different issues that are on the Hill. Again, you're going to have to go to the running out of time. So you'll have to go to the references to find these clear issues that the mandates are, in fact, if you are people of faith, if you are people of the Declaration of Independence, if you are people of the foundational truth of constitutionalism and federalism and true Christianity, then all of this stuff is illegal. First off, because a lot of these departments shouldn't even exist. They're unconstitutional, but we know that they've been manipulated by the courts, by the manipulation of the 14th Amendment, and so on. So here is another article uh, from the Federalists. Vaccine and mass coercion is a purge of Republican voters, and Republicans are letting it happen. I'm that is a great article. You guys, you got to go read it. Guys and gals, yeah, that, that is just amazing to me. Because we have so many limp-wristed Republicans that should be fighting for liberty, and they are not. I think that uh, Joy Pullman's article here is knock it out of the park. And if you're vetting candidates, if you're asking the real questions, you need to ask, why aren't they standing up for your rights and liberties? Why are they not putting in uh, legislation for those that are already there? that will stop forced mandates. Why are not county commissioners doing that? Why are not your trustees taking and standing for your liberties? Because remember, in Ohio in particular, the trustees and those that are on city councils or mayors in townships, villages, and cities are responsible for picking the health board and that person that then is in charge of the health commission within your county. Well, we're down to the last minute. And there's a, a number of different articles here that I would really like to uh, bring to your attention. But one, uh, two, real quick, and then you'll have to go look at them in the references. I'm just going to tell you the title. Biden vaccine rules set stage for onslaught of lawsuits. If there's not an onslaught of lawsuits, then you're asleep, people. You need to act. You need to act. And I'm going to tell you one of the, where you can go and look at what you need to act with. There's another one here from the Hill. Make employer vaccine mandates illegal. It's a matter of individual rights. It is. It's in the state constitution of Ohio, Article 1. And in these last 46 sec seconds, what I want you to look at is at uh, the, um, the Federalist, 85 things you can do to help the United States shake wide awake. It's important. Great article. Great 85 steps. Sam Adams executed a lot of those 85 steps, as well as the rest of the founders that went to convention in 1774 and declared independence in 1776. Come on back. 
when Sam Adams returns next week and we find what is important to drive home, maybe out of those 85 ideas. See you then.